Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and Key Time Enforcement Institute, sponsored by the ABA Criminal Justice Section. This session is entitled Damages and Penalties Update. Before I introduce our panel, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Cone Cone and Colapinto LLP is the supporting sponsor for the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and Key Time Enforcement Institute. Thank you for your support. Moderating this session is Eric Sudachuk. Eric is a partner at Morgan Lewis in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Eric, you may proceed with the program. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. We have a very experienced panel to talk about our topic, and let me introduce them to you now. Ed Crook is the Assistant Director of um, the DOJ's Civil Fraud Section in Washington. Ed has represented the government in a very broad variety of healthcare fraud matters against, I, I think, virtually every type of player in, in the healthcare market. Um, joining Ed and I is Pam Johnston. Pam is a partner in uh, Foley and Lardner and a member of its government enforcement practice. Um, she's been on the defense side for many years. Um, prior to that, she was an AUSA in Los Angeles, where she served first in the civil and then in the criminal division. Also joining us is Lon Levitt. Lon is a partner and a chair of the False Claims Act whistleblower practice group at the a Luna law firm in Arizona. Uh, Lon has a relators practice, a relators council practice that's nationwide in scope. And he was previously in AUSA in Arizona. Last but certainly not least is Sarah, Sarah Van. Sarah is an assistant attorney general in Georgia. Um, she is in the Medicaid fraud control unit there. Uh, Sarah also serves as the co-chair of Nam Foucault's KETAM subcommittee. Um, prior to joining the, the AG's office in Georgia, Sarah was in private practice as a relator's counsel. So with that, let me um, turn it over to Lon to begin the substance of the presentation. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts today on uh, damages and penalties in the False Claims Act space. Um, in my experience, uh, the issue of damages is the most frequently contested and litigated issue um, in False Claims Act cases. And I think the reason for that is because it's universally contested. Um, we know that some issues such as materiality and knowledge uh, are frequently sources of debate, uh, but I can recall cases throughout my career where those issues were not uh, contested significantly. But as I think back, I don't recall a single case where the fact of damages or the amount of damages or both uh, were not uh, contested by the defendant. So, um, I think this is this is really a universally uh, contested uh, issue in these types of cases. And of course, we start with the statutory text itself. Um, the False Claims Act states that uh, damages will, will be set at three times the amount of damages sustained by the government because of the act of the defendant. And also there's an imposition of a per claim civil penalty. Um, the Supreme Court has recognized in the Cook County case that the treble damages provision serves both remedial and punitive purposes. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the statutory text is a useful starting point, but of course the False Claims Act itself uh, gives little guidance on how the measure of damages is applied in particular types of cases. And there's also no single rule on how to calculate damages. Um, facts, of course, matter tremendously. And it seems that the primary goal um, is to make the government whole um, that seems to be sort of the undergirding principle here. The government often incurs investigational costs, consequential damages. Uh, there may be prejudgment interest concerns. And it seems that the, that the case law uh, primarily supports to the idea of making the government whole. Two cases in particular talk about this, the Marcus v. Hess case from the Supreme Court and also the SAIC case from the D.C. Circuit. Um, how, of course, to put the government in the same position as it was prior to receiving false claims um, leads to a discussion of full value uh, versus benefit of the bargain. And for that, um, I'll turn it over to Pam. Thanks, Lon. Well, this case starts out, uh, you know, really it goes back to the idea of what has the government already received and has it received something that should be accounted for in the measure damages. 
is it always 100% of the money received by the defendant, or can it be some subset of that? And this body of cases technically started in 1976 prior to the 1986 amendments, which are the main amendments that, that we all now work with, that made the False Claims Act what it is today. But back in 1976, there was a case that was brought. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? There was a case that was brought, uh, U.S. versus Bornstein. And what you find when you're looking at this area, you'll find yourself going back to this case. I don't think it's all that helpful because it, it didn't have the current language of the False Claims Act, but it does have this footnote, footnote number 12, where it talks about the government's actual damages need to be equal to the difference between market value and the amount that the government actually received if it had gotten the specified quantity or quality. So you have this, this delta or difference that gets starting to built in. It takes a long time for that case to develop any kind of legs. Can we go to the next one, please? So the first case you'll really see um, something being described, and I, I, I had a case, a uh, government lawyer who had this case, and he, he swore this really wasn't the, the benchmark that it has become. Um, so I understand the government doesn't necessarily view this as the case the defense does. But from the defense perspective, we see this case, this one out of D.C., U.S. Scientific, as the one where uh, the idea really gets started. And it starts to have some words around it and measurements around it. Uh, it, adopt, it adopts a view of what is the government's out-of-pocket costs. So a very different concept. Uh, what is the government really out? And in the, in the modern era, this is usually the place where if you're writing a brief, this is where you start. You start with this case because it's the one that has the most detail. And it's been followed all over the country. Now, there's still some circuits that haven't decided which way they're going to fall. You'll notice we don't have any case from the Ninth Circuit. Um, there's a couple other circuits as well that we don't have any case law from. But this one tends to be the leading case, and it's the one most of us discuss. Next, please. So we'll start with the ones where some less than full value is used. I would say the one out of Savannah, the one out of the Fourth Circuit, is one of the ones most followed. Um, and it, again, along with the DC one, it's this idea that the government, for example, got something. Um, I did a case where the government got affordable housing. And most of the value was recognized. But there was a portion that the government didn't get its full value. It didn't get a portion of the affordable housing that was supposed to be set aside for the disabled. The housing for the disabled wasn't up to the proper standards. And so the government didn't get its full value. It was a, the perfect kind of case to look at the value of what the government got versus what it should have gotten. And the difference was how we measured damage in that case. And I know we're going to talk about that case later. This was actually a grant case. But the point is it's an easy illustration of when the government agrees that there's something that's not working right, but it isn't the full value of the whole contract or the whole grant, as the case may be. Next, please. There are, of course, a whole bunch of cases, and this tends to be the government's starting position of full value of the case. So there's lots of situations where that is factually correct, where the government contracted, say it contracted for the production of a vaccine. You can imagine if there was one of the pharma companies out there and they, they took the money and they did something terrible and it didn't really work out and they didn't get the value of the vaccine, that would probably be a full value case. Uh, and the reason it makes sense is because the government recognizes no value to what they received. Uh, and again, it tends to be very fact specific, um, but there are definitely times when um, it is this difference. So the cases that I would say lead on this one, it's this Rogan case out of the Seventh Circuit. That's the one most of us look to um, and try to figure out, is this the one that applies? It happens to be a, a AKS of anti-kickback statute. And I would say most of the time, and I think Eric's going to talk about this, but most of the time with anti-kickback, if we're talking about a kickback, it's usually full value, but sometimes it's not. Depends on the case, I guess, and, and how open the government is to trying to find a solution. And obviously, because of the huge value of the damages in these cases, you know, if you were to go to trial and lose, you're going to get three times whatever the X is. And then you're going to get all those civil penalties. And this is why so many cases don't go to trial and they do settle. So damages is often the real heart of the case because you're trying to get it resolved once everybody knows what the facts are. Next, please. <laughs> 
All right, Bill, we're going on. All right, so one issue that, of course, comes up here is, is what is the three X? Is it gross trebling or is it net trebling? And this slide has a simple example that can help illustrate the differences in the way these uh, treble damages provisions are calculated. Let's, let's presume that the government paid company A $100,000 um, on fraudulently submitted claims. Let's further presume that the government received $90,000 worth of value. Um, under the gross trebling standard, uh, the court would determine the actual price that the government paid um, for those false claims and then treble that amount. So here, um, there would be $100,000 uh, multiple of times three, that would be 300,000. And then of course the value would be offset from the back end. So damages would be $210,000. Um, under the net trebling approach, the court would first determine the difference or the delta between um, the, the goods actual price um, and that would have prevailed in, in competition and then and treble that difference. So here, what we would do is we would take um, $100,000 and, and first deduct the 90,000 representing the value received and then treble the difference, which would be a $30,000 damage calculation, which is one seventh of, of what uh, gross trebling would yield. And so you can see there could be a significant difference in, in how that approach uh, turns out. Next slide, please. In 2008 and 2009, uh, there were a couple of uh, appellate court decisions adopting the gross trebling standard. Uh, the Ninth Circuit adopted it in Eggball, and, and then uh, the Fifth Circuit a year later in Longhi uh, adopted the uh, gross trebling standard there as well. Um, Eggball dealt with fraud involving HUD insured mortgages, and uh, Longhi was a grant fraud case. And uh, up to that point, they were pretty good pretty good case law there um, supporting that, that standard. That, however, is now the minority view. Um, if we could go to the next slide, we can see that starting in late 2010, uh, several other courts of appeals adopted the net, net trebling view. Uh, the SAIC case, uh, the DC circuit, which we've discussed, and also the second, sixth, and seventh circuits um, all issued published opinions adopting the net trebling view, which I believe now is, is the majority view. Um, next slide, please. With that, I will turn this back over to Pam to talk a bit about uh, interest and, and civil penalties. So at the beginning, Lon mentioned that you can sometimes get interest, and that's right. You can get prejudgment interest on the retaliation claim, the H claim, but you can't get prejudgment interest mm -hmm. on the reg, you know, regular false claims. It's not part of the statute, so it's not available. Of course, like any uh, federal judgment, once you have a judgment, you can get post-judgment interest. Um, so interest is not usually part of the settlement except when you're trying to settle the, the uh, retaliation claim. Next slide, please. All right, we included this chart because it's getting a little complicated to keep track of what number you should be using if you have a case where you need to include the claims. Again, if you go to trial and lose, you're going to be using this chart because you're going to have to use every single false claim times it uh, by the number that's going to be applicable. It's up to the court. It's not a jury issue up to the court to determine uh, the amount to put. So in other words, the minimum and the maximum, that's for the court's discretion. But the court is obligated under the statute to impose the, the penalties, assuming it's been pled right. So in the old days, it used to be $5,000. And then for a little while, it was $5,500 as a minimum. That can start to stack up pretty quickly. And you'll see that as of 2015, now it starts to index up. So. If you have claims that are after 2015, and you can easily have them before, because we could be working with the 10-year statute of limitations, you know, maybe you're working with the six-year statute of limitations. So we're still within the statute of limitations for the old amounts. But as the cases get newer and newer, obviously we're going to be going into the new periods. And when we do that, now the minimums are going to become closer to $11,000, and then the maximums, which doesn't happen in most circumstances, but uh, the maximums will be 22 and 23,000. What I notice when I'm talking about civil penalties with a new relator counsel is they have taken the case thinking that that is going to be how they're going to get paid, and they don't realize that that usually in most settlements isn't accounted for, unless obviously there's some strange set of facts. So that in most circumstances, we're not settling on the civil penalties, we're settling on the false claims. Um, but it's always there. In some cases, obviously, it does make sense to use it when there's no particular damages, but there's a, a real harm uh, that's been issued 
So that's it on civil penalties. Uh, now over to Sarah to talk about statistical sampling. Please send any questions you have, by the way, uh, with the chat button. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, we wanted to address statistical sampling as part of the damages discussion because many FCA cases involve voluminous claims. A statistical sampling can be the most practical manner of establishing damages. It's time saving, it's cost saving, and solves the too big to fail issue that some of these cases present. And here are some good court excerpts that recognize that sampling is a convenient methodology in large cases. Talking about the sheer scale of the Medicare program, it is not practical to do a claim by claim review. Sampling is the only feasible method given the enormous logistical problems. And in Rogan, the claim by claim review is a formula for paralysis. So there's plenty of support for using sampling for this very reason. If we can go to the next slide, please. And statistical sampling is well established as a method to establish damages in fraud cases. Uh, the Fadul case in example of 551 claims out of 14,000. America's mortgage involved a random stratified sample from over 17,000 loans submitted over a 10-year period. And in Robinson, the government reviewed claims out of 26,000. And the court in Robinson stated to require the United States to present individual evidence on each one of the 26,000 claims at issue would be unreasonable, likely impossible, and a waste of resources. Indeed, to take Dr. Robinson's argument to its logical conclusion would frustrate the purposes of the FCA because it would likely encourage anyone who submitted fraudulently submitted claims to Medicare to do so in extremely large quantities so as to prevent the government from logistically being able to bring suit. So that nicely describes the too big to fail problem. And there's plenty of support for the idea that damages can be proven with statistical sampling. Next slide, please. The Supreme Court has held that a representative or statistical sample, like all evidence, is a means to establish or defend against liability. However, here are cases where sampling was rejected to establish liability. And they're important cases to know in the False Claims Act context. In Agape, the court found that the underlying review was too particular to the facts of each file. It involved making medical necessity determinations of nursing home patients. And in Vista Hospice Care, the review involved the eligibility of hospice patients. And the court found the review's subjective criteria did not lend itself to sampling. So it's important to recognize that it's an intensive inquiry and whether sampling will be allowed will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We go to the next slide. The key takeaways from the case law are that like all expert testimony, it comes down to a Daubert review. Uh, proponents of sampling need to be prepared for attacks on the methodology selected. They will have to show that the standard is reliable. And the findings of a sample review constitute, constitute circumstantial evidence. The opposing party will often have a competing review it offers the fact finder. Uh, next slide, please. Another takeaway from the case law is to account for all rele relevant variables. Vistacare provides a lesson learned in that regard. In that case, the relator's hospice expert testified that his review determined there were differences based on the types of terminal illness and that practices varied among different locations. Yet the statistician did not differentiate geographically across the 14 states or differentiate by disease type. And the court found that the failure of the expert to listen to the reviewing expert was fatal. Uh, the second takeaway is to know your policies and rules and make sure that the sample is carefully drawn to find falsity. And Rite Aid has a really good discussion of that. We can go to the next slide. So that's what the courts say, but in practice, what are some factors to take into account in sampling for damage? Well, first, make sure as part of that, you have a methodology that can be by appropriate validation, it can be shown through citation of objective sources. In the healthcare fraud environment where I practice, here are some helpful resources that I use. And you'll see these cited in the court cases mentioned previously. These sources lay out important tips, such as the importance of the use of a probability sample that is randomly generated, by which every element has a non-zero probability of being selected. In other words, the claims don't overlap or appear twice in a sample. If we go to the next slide. And here are some considerations I look at in the healthcare fraud context in forming a sample. And one of the first questions to ask is what programs are at issue? 
Which Medicare program, A, B, C, or D, is the sample going to cover? Does it include multiple Medicaid programs, either several states or within a single state fee-for-service and managed care programs? Does it include TRICARE? Can these programs be sampled as a single population or do they need to be split out? That depends on a lot of factors. For instance, was the provider enrolled in all of these programs during the same time frame? Do they have the same coverage rules and policy guidance as far as what is covered and under what circumstances? If the answers are that the rules are different, how will this affect the sample? Second, the coordination of data is important to make sure there are no duplicative claims. Medicare is the secondary payer for TRICARE claims, and Medicaid is the payer of last resort, and it can be the secondary payer for either Medicare or TRICARE. Thus, you have the issue of crossover claims. Dual eligible beneficiaries can appear in multiple data sets, and these need to be deduplicated before any sample is run. Third, for healthcare, we need to know if there have been any CPT or ICD-10 changes. In the laboratory testing environment, for example, there have been several changes over time to the CPTs for drug screening. How do these change the regulatory framework? And for diagnosis changes, you might want to know whether there are accepted diagnosis codes for specific procedures before you draw your sample. Uh, fourth, we want to do as much research as possible into the provider as is practical prior to drawing the sample. We look for provider interaction with the program. Has the provider received education on particular rules? Has there been audits with findings? Was the conduct different at different locations or in different management? Geographic considerations are part of what we look at, so that's very helpful information to know. And finally, we need feedback from the statistician. It's always important to listen to the expert, and I find it's an iterative process. So those are some of the considerations in forming a sample uh, for damages, and I've presented a rather pro viewpoint of the use of statistical sampling in FCA cases. So I'd like to kick this to the defense counsel on the panel, Pam and, and Eric, and just ask what is the defense perspective of some of the drawbacks to sampling? Well, sir, I'd be happy to, to, to start this off. Um, the, you know, obviously sampling's here to stay. Um, and it's turning a lot of FCA cases into, um, battles, Delbert hearings that, that can in many ways determine whether there's really a case there or not. One thing that concerns me that I see being advocated more and more, though, is an implicit use of sampling to cover the issue of Santa. Now, in, in some cases, representative samples are representative samples. Um, and if it happened 10% of the time and the statistician has the right seed and all those statisticians, um, it's not unreasonable to extrapolate from that. But there's many False Claims Act cases that involve a lot of individual conduct, the decisions that are made thousands of times that I don't think really can effectively or fairly be subject to sampling. For example, um, the, you know, the Rite Aid case, I'm involved in that, so I won't comment on that generally. But when you think about situations such as, say, False Claims Act cases brought on um, the sale of controlled substances and whether or not the requirements of the Controlled Substance Act were followed, and the theory is if they knowingly were not, then, then there could be False Claims Act liability. But there you can't, in my view, you can't take a sample of, let's say, well, let's look at 50 pharmacies and see how many times pharmacists sold controlled substances where they shouldn't have, and then extrapolate that across because it's an individual judgment, an individual pharmacist judgment, and the scienter at issue is the individual pharmacist scienter. So I really don't see how sampling can be used in situations where you're talking about individual decision-making as the thing that most relates to the question of the application of the application. So I agree with, with what Eric said. And what I what I see, I usually have two places where I don't feel comfortable using sampling. The first is what you talked about, which is sort of the subjective. Uh, there was a subjective aspect to the process. And because of that, you can't extrapolate across a group of people or a group of claims. Um, it just doesn't fit. And there's some case law that Sarah talked about. The second thing I see a lot is that for reasons I don't completely understand, HHS has a tendency to pick too small a sample at the beginning. So when you get your original CID or other version of a subpoena, you get a request for, say, 160 records or sometimes 60 records. And then we're going to all do the case based on 60 records. 
um, which is, in my view, insane because it doesn't, it, it can't be used. If you talk to a biostatistician, it can't be used. It's not big enough. It's not representative enough. Um, so, to me, as a defense counsel, one of the difficult questions to decide is do I start to have this statistics question with the government at the very beginning? Because we're already off to a bad start and we've got too small a sample and now we're all going to make decisions based on that. So to me, that's a strategic question and some clients want to do it one way and some clients want to do it another and I understand why that can be the case. To me, if you're going to do that not right at the beginning, then you've got to hire your biostatistician. You've got to work this out at the front end. Um, and it, it works best, I think, when you've got a situation where there's something systemic. It was a policy decision. It was a programming decision in the computer. There was something that makes this consistent across the body of time. And then, you know, I'm for the statistics because it'll tell us the right answer. We don't have to look at 10,000 claims. We really can look at 700 or 1,000 or 1,400 or whatever the statistician says is the number. Thank you. For Relator Council, uh, what are some of the challenges Relators face in the use of statistical sampling in FCA cases? Well, I guess what I'd like to do is divide that answer into two, two parts based on the stage of the case. Um, you know, before the intervention decision, there's a challenge in that oftentimes as Relators Council, we don't have the full data set that is relevant. Um, oftentimes our clients see a small piece of, of uh, the total scope of the misconduct and the data set that we're working with is incomplete. And so uh, one way to get a complete universe of claims and therefore draw an appropriate sample would be to try to work with the government um, to obtain and access to and, and analyze a more complete data set or to provide suggestions of the government on how it might do that. Um, after the intervention decision, decision if, if we're declining, you know, litigating a declined case, I think there are the challenges some of the ones that uh, Pam and Eric just mentioned. First of all, there's going to be a challenge from the defendant as to whether sampling can be used at all. It's a legal challenge broadly to that, um, either for liability uh, purposes, damages purposes, or both. And so I think that's one hurdle that needs to be overcome. Assuming that agreement can be reached or the court will endorse uh, sampling uh, as a general matter, I think then the, the devil's in the details. Uh, oftentimes the Relator wants to impose liability for a, a broader period of time or a larger geographic scope or perhaps a greater number of billing codes than the defendant believes is relevant or appropriate. Um, and so that can create some, some challenges just nailing down the specifics of uh, what's been alluded to here today, uh, making sure we have the right codes, is the coverage criteria different, um, are there different programs, time periods and things. So um, I would say those are some of the challenges that Relators Council and Relators face. Thank you. Pass it back to the next. Sorry, I did the classic classic COVID talking with the mute button on. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and the next slide after that. Thanks, Courtney. So. So the next topic we wanted to talk about was damages in False Claims Act cases uh, founded on alleged violations of the anti kickback Act. And um, of course, to, to I think to all of us, government counsel, relators counsel, and defense attorneys alike, the uh, anti kickback statute is um, is familiar to us. Uh, for some of us, uh, painfully familiar. Um, and we've seen the breadth and scope of how it's used and this this slide just gives a flavor of that because obviously it's a broadly written statute dealing with things like intent to induce um the aca amendment says that all kickbacks are false claims act violations so long as the claims result from the kickback whatever that means um and as a result we've seen any kickback act theories and false claims act cases that are as broad and as creative as the government and relators council um, can be and often are. I've even seen them recently, this theory recently applied um, in generic pharmaceutical price fixing cases where somehow price fixing is viewed as a kickback. So there's no limit to the breadth of how the anti-kickback statute can be applied. Um, and that breadth applies equally to the theories of damages arising from anti-kickback act violations. 
sometimes it seems uh, and it feels like uh, any kickback is kind of like a new, neutron bomb. You, you drop a kickback in there, and no matter what the, the, the value or necessity of the goods or services provided, um, or how long they're provided for or why they're provided, that neutron bomb of the kickback obliterates all signs of life with respect to any of that um, and defaults to uh, just counting up claims uh, and how much the government uh, paid for those claims. Uh, next slide, please. The, um, and unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of case law out there that addresses this. Um, Pam referenced it before. Uh, and the, 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 the core case and the one that is most often relied on, um, on the other side by relators and government counsel, uh, is the Rogan litigation uh, out of Illinois and the Seventh Circuit. Um, there's not a lot of case law because not a lot of these cases get tried. And obviously, you know, sometimes you'll have damages issues in summary judgment, but there's just not that much out there. And Rogan's one of the few cases. And, and what Rogan does is the district court um, takes a look at what the measure of damages in False Claims Act cases should be generally. Um, and it really uses the classic Bornstein standard, which is the amount of money that the government um, paid out by reason of the false claims over and above what it had, would have paid if the claims had not been false. Now, you know, from the defense perspective, so far, so good. We're going to take a look at what the value of what the government got uh, and then determine based on that what the difference in value was um, with regard to the fact that it was obtained um, in some way through a kickback. Uh, but the Rogan court didn't stop there. Uh, the Rogan court said that applying that test, damages are the value of the claims defendants submitted on behalf of the patients referred. In other words, there is no assessment of whether the government received any value from the goods or services that were somehow affected by the kickbacks. It's the entirety of the price of those goods and services that are going to be the basis for the single damages calculation. It went up to the Seventh Circuit, um, and the Seventh Circuit agreed, not with uh, a lot of analysis. It was a classically short Judge Easterbrook opinion, and, and what Judge Easterbrook said was that the government insurance programs the government health care programs are essentially insurance programs. Um, and that insurance is provided with conditions. And according to Judge Easterbrook, one of those conditions is compliance with the Anti-Kickback Act. Um, and if the conditions for insurance aren't met, then nothing is due. Um, and as a result of that, the district court's decision to value kickback damages based on the entirety of the value of the claim submitted was upheld by the Seventh Circuit. And that is really the, the, the only case that is out there that squarely confronts this issue of how to calculate damages in a False Claims Act any that case. Next slide, please. But there's some issues with Rogan that I think leave this one that this issue, one that's open for continued debate and litigation, um, because right now Rogan's kind of standing out there by itself. And there's a couple of problems with Rogan. One is the classic thing that you know defense attorneys gripe about, which is bad facts make bad law. Rogan arose out of a criminal case. There were criminal convictions. Um, there was just a, a, a rotten set of facts there, and you know the court was looking at the application of damages arising from what was clearly criminal anti-kickback act behavior. So that didn't help. Um, but the other thing, and I think it's a, an area with that, the, the Rogan court didn't distinguish either at the district court or the court of appeals level, and is worth considering, is that Rogan was premised on the idea, as Judge Easterbrook wrote, that compliance with the anti-kickback act is a condition of payment. Now, the problem is the district court in its analysis muddles up Stark and the Anti-Kickback Act. And Stark, the, the, anti -refer, the, the physician anti-referral law, um, it explicitly provides that it's a condition of payment. In other words, if, if there is a Stark violation, there's not going to be any. And you can see that there, Judge Easterbrook's reasoning um, makes some sense. Um, but with respect to the Anti-Kickback Act, although there are government programs that require certification and in, in the billing documents that you've complied with the Anti-Kickback Act. Nowhere in the Anti-Kickback Act or 
any regulation promulgated there under, which is really the safe harbors. Does it ever say that compliance is a condition of payment with respect to federal health care programs? Um, and the ACA, with the resulting from language, certainly doesn't change that. It doesn't, it doesn't say that it's a condition. So I think there's room there for arguments to be made that rather than looking at kickback cases as per se full value cases, that the court should go back and look at the individual facts of the case based on the classic Bornstein analysis, and you can see that here, um, that has been repeated by the courts time and time again. Um, comparing what the government paid versus what it would have paid um, had there not been a kickback. If we could uh, go to the next slide. So in making those arguments, there, there are some things that I think um, can be pointed to, both in terms of reasoning in the case law, that, that should leave the, the Rogan analysis still somewhat up for grabs. Um, the first is the, the, the venerable purposes of the Anti-Kickback Act statute, which is to protect independent um, decision-making, whether it be by physicians or other providers or patients. Um, there's the classic statements that the Anti-Kickback Act is designed to prevent overutilization um, and to um, prevent the improper influence uh, on decision-making of things of value that can result in the prescribing of, of goods or services that are in excess of what's truly needed. So in that sense, the Anti-Kickback Act itself and its fundamental purposes would seem to support an actual loss versus the value of the um, versus uh, the value of the claim analysis, there is some case law that um, can be pointed to to support that view. Um, it's not in the pure FCA any kickback act setting, um, but I think it has some uh, viable analysis that can be viewed as analogous um, and uh, it should be grounds for for further discussions in the court courts about this issue. Um, the the Harrison versus Westinghouse case uh, out of the Fourth Circuit. Um, it's not a kickback case. It's a case where there was a violation of the underlying contract of in, a conflict of interest requirements in government contracting. Uh, and there the relator argued that the entirety of the amount of the claims submitted to the government should be forfeited because the conflict of interest provisions were violated. And the court said, no, we're not going to do that. And the reason we're not going to do that is we need to look at what the, the value of what the, the government received. And in fact, uh, in that case, there was no evidence put on that the government didn't receive anything other than the full value of the services that it had contracted for. Um, and as a result of that, the court found it to be a, a no-loss case. Um, the relator was left to get proclaimed penalties uh, and their attorney's fees. Um, so that's a case that can be used to support the view that actual law shouldn't be completely thrown out the window uh, in any kickback act cases. Um, another another case that's very helpful there is actually a criminal anti-kickback act case where the issue came up in the context of what is the loss to the government from the perspective of uh, restitution. Uh, and there the 11th Circuit held that, in fact, in a situation uh, where there is a kickback that results in claims to federal health care programs, if in fact there's no evidence that those claims had diminished value because of the kickback. In other words, that the government would been, have been able to procure those services more cheaply or that there was an impact on utilization as a result of the kickback. The court would default to a presumption that it is the amount of the kickback that should be viewed as the loss to the government, given the reasoning that um, but if they were willing to pay the kickback, uh, they could have provided, provided the, the, the products cheaper without the kickback. Um, so there is some law out there that can be used to uh, keep the ball in the air in terms of right th what the right measure of damages is with respect to the anti-kickback statute. Next slide. What, what I'd like to, um, to, to, to leave this discussion with is the 2010 amendments to the ACA that included the provision that an anti-kickback violation is a false claims act violation if the claims resulted from the kickback. Now, theoretically, that's probably a, you know a liability or causation issue. Not sure whether causation falls within the rubric of damages or liability, but it's not a measure of damages issue per se. But it does, in many cases, really affect the measure of damages 
and the amount of damages that are at issue for this reason. And there's this is something that the, the cases don't answer. And what the cases don't answer is, if there is a kickback, how long does it last? In other words, you sort of take the classic example, um, extreme hypothetical, of a pharmaceutical sales rep walking into a physician's office with a giant pizza that's got everything, all the toppings on it, right? And the pharmaceutical rep is bringing that pizza into the office because the pharmaceutical rep thinks that if the physician eats my pizza, then the physician's going to be more likely to prescribe my drug. So they provide that thing of value to the physician with the intent to induce the with the intention to induce the physician to uh, prescribe their product. Is that a kickback act violation? Sure, it's a kickback act violation. But does that mean that every prescription that is written for the until the end of time by that doctor is somehow tainted by that pizza and therefore a non reimbursable illegal prescription? Or does there need to be some limits to it? Well, the courts are starting to take a look at that resulting language in trying to think about what those limits might be. But the most that we've gotten out of the courts so far on this topic is the idea of linkage, that somehow there has to be proof that the false claim, the decision, the prescription, whatever, is linked to the kickback. Now, the courts don't tell us what linkage means. Instead, they look at the facts of the case and they decide whether it's sufficiently linked or not. So there's going to be a lot more activity here uh, as this unfolds and this resulting um, firm question uh, gets uh, gets further litigated and discussed by the courts. So with that, let me um, let me. I had a couple questions that I wanted to to ask our panel, and 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 let me uh, turn the first one to Lon. Lon, from from the perspective of a relator's counsel. Um, do you worry about this question of, of how long the taint lasts? And do you look, um, to, do you think about whether you need expert testimony or other kind of proof um, to show that the taint uh, has, has existed within, within a, a, a kickback transaction um, for a period of time? I would say yes. It's definitely something that we look to and want to analyze. Um, my personal view on this is that there need to be limits. Um, you know, I think under your hypothetical that you pose, I think it would be unreasonable to argue that, you know, by receiving that pizza, that that taint somehow lasts forever, um, that that doctor would basically be ruined for life. Um, you know, there's a very helpful case actually that came out about three weeks ago out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, the Gohill case, uh, U.S. XRL Gohill versus Sanofi U.S. Services. Um, and that case uh, involved summary judgment motions and Relators Council uh, put on evidence uh, of expert testimony from a couple of physicians who opined that, uh, based on empirical literature, that the taint uh, could last and could impact prescribing behavior for up to two years. And and that uh, testimonial evidence was, by way of affidavit, was sufficient to uh, overcome summary judgment. So um, I think, and I think it was even broken down in other uh, shorter time periods. I think there was a bucket of claims and for six months and from the data kickback event and then one year and and then of course two years but you know i don't know if that's a bright line rule or not and it's i don't mean to suggest that every court would go that way but i thought the court's analysis in that uh, in that go hill case was helpful both in terms of an amount of time that might be reasonable to look at and also a way to go about proving it up and and I will I will say, Lon, that that I agree with you. That opinion is very helpful. And I, what I found in in litigating these cases uh, where this question has come up, um, not to the point there's been any written opinions or orders on it, um, but where judges have expressed concerns that the anti kickback statute can't create unlimited or endless liability, that there's got to be some uh, limits around it. And I've seen judges shift the burden to relators' counsel in non intervening cases to present the courts with some theories of how they can show a reasonable basis to say that the impact of the kickback continues. And with that in mind, um, it, does the government always take a sort of, in terms of presenting damages cases, moving forward in contested cases, uh, does the government take a hard line that it's, it's unlimited actual loss or are there situations where the government will um, look at either the value of the goods or services provided um, or itself put some limits on the um, the, the length of the taint uh, in putting forward its damages theories. 
you know, I think uh, to, to take a step back, I think we disagree, or I disagree. I should start off by saying before I get too far into this, make the point that I'm here on my own uh, uh, as an as an individual, uh, not as a representative of the government. So the opinions that I'm expressing are are my own, uh, not not necessarily the the department's views. Um, I, I would like to take a step back um, and and address some of the issues that you raised earlier about medical necessity and overutilization. Um, the, the issue here is, is not uh, that the overutilization and the medical necessity aren't what make the claim false in, a, in, an, in an AKS case. The issue is that the medical judgment of the physician was compromised by unlawful, illegal uh, financial remuneration. And, and at that point, we don't have trust in, in that medical provider's judgment. And what federal health care programs are paying for is, is uh, claims, is services, and items that are provided without that taint. And so if they're, if they're tainted by um, the, the uh, unlawful remuneration, if we don't trust the physician's judgment, then, then the federal health care programs aren't getting what they paid for. And, and that's what makes those claims false. So there, so there may be a claim where the physician's medical judgment is compromised or by the, the, um, the, the taint, by the, the, the false, uh, the, the, the kickback. Um, but there, there may be medical necessity uh, for that claim. But that doesn't make the claim not false. It still uh, has the, the, the taint of the AKS. Um, and in looking at, at this issue of how long does the taint last, I think, you know, we're not bringing the pizza case. We're not, <laughs> we're not pursuing a case. I mean, maybe if it's extra large, I don't know. But no, we're not bringing the pizza case. Um, we're bringing cases where the kickbacks are, are systemic or uh, significant. And, and um, so we're not bringing a case where there's one speaker engagement and we're looking at the taint and trying to figure out what the taint is from that one speaker engagement for the one physician. It's a pattern that we're seeing. And very often there's evidence with, that we're uh, amassing through our investigation that allow us to, to make judgments about how long that taint lasts. If it's a series of speaker programs, clearly the time period between each one of those speaker programs is a time period that the, uh, the taint would apply to. The, the physicians received the money for one speaker engagement and is looking forward to the next speaker engagement. And if that next speaker engagement is uh, intended to influence their their prescribing habits. Certainly, that's happening during that entire time period. Uh, in between them, and you can expect it to have last for some period after that. Obviously, it's not forever. It's not till the end of time that that happens. And so, we're going to be looking at um, the evidence. How large was it? What is what? What can you expect? And, and I think defendants recognize that there's some way to quantify uh, the, uh, the taint. Um, we very often see return on investment analyses. We don't see them as frequently <laughs> because I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of defendants have recognized that that's probably not the best thing to, to be analyzing or at least not calling it a return on investment. Um, but defendants... Uh, very often there'll be documents in the defendant's own records that make it clear that they recognize that, uh, that the kickback that they're paying extends over a period of time. So, so I think it's going to, in the end, be a fact-specific analysis. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at those, those issues of, of the type of kickback, the, um, the amount of the kickback, the frequency of the kickbacks in making that determination of how, when, when do we, uh, when can we determine that the, the, the healthcare provider is free from the taint associated with that, with that uh, kickback. Thank you, Ed. And with that, let me um, hand it over to you to talk about grants. Okay, oh, great. Um, let me figure out, get my notes here since it came up. Uh, okay, so we're gonna talk about grants, but we're gonna do it pretty quickly because uh, um, we have another panel later on today that's gonna be talking about
grants in more detail, not specific to damages, but they're going to go into damages as well. And and in fact, they're also going to be speaking specifically about um, uh, COVID-related uh, uh, funding grants uh, and loans and damages associated with that. So I encourage you to attend that session as well um, to, to hear some more about grants more broadly and sort of in that context of, of COVID-related uh, issues. Um, but sort of from a, a broad overview, um, there have been a number of cases uh, where there's been FCA liability, cases, uh, investigations, settlements, litigation involving grants. Um, and, and FCA liability can arise in the grant context uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, there can be liability for misrepresentations in the context of the application, so a fraud in the inducement type theory. Uh, there can be liability for violations in the administration of the grant, uh, failure to segregate funds from the grant or commingling funds between various grants or uh, operating costs. And then there can be liability for failure to comply with the requirements of the grant. So uh, the failure to use the funds for the purpose for which they were intended or not meet the requirements in, in administering those funds. And, and damages in this context are, are uh, seemingly complicated. Um, there's issues related to the fact that the grants may be uh, provided in a lump sum, uh, they may be provided to one entity that's then going to disperse the grants to others. Um, there may be a situation where there's um, multiple purposes for the grant. So the grant may be used for uh, one purpose, like developing infrastructure, and then have another purpose as well, which is just economic, uh, spur economic uh, development and growth. So, you know, looking at uh, these issues altogether, we've seen some large settlements, some medium-sized settlements, small settlements. There's a few recent ones that I've put in, in this slide, uh, one involving the city of Los Angeles uh, that was a $3.1 million settlement based on failure to comply with the requirements of the grant uh, in, in, in developing federally funded affordable housing, not, not having the federal accessibility laws followed. And then a couple of healthcare uh, research grants, NIH research grant cases. And, and the case law looking at the damages in this case, so those are settlements. Can we move to the next slide, please? The, um, the case law in the grant cases um, is, is pretty uniform in finding that the grants, uh, that it's the, it's the whole enchilada. <laughs> it's the, uh, um, that when uh, there's a finding that the grant was uh, fraudulently induced, um, the government's damages are the entire amount of the grant. And Longhi, which has been mentioned a couple of other times in this presentation, is, is one of the leading cases in the grant context. Um, I've cited some other case, case law here um, that essentially hold that same, that same uh, have that same holding. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, and uh, then uh, um, this, the last case that we included in, in the slides is sort of a cautionary tale. Um, this was a declined case where the relator was going forward and uh, alleged substandard work uh, that was funded by a grant and didn't it quantify the damages in their initial disclosures or, or pretrial conference report. Um, so the, the court denied the relator's motion to amend their final pretrial order um, and include a discussion of damages. And ultimately, they got a single, single penalty uh, and no damages, although presumably attorney's fees as well. Um, so, so a cautionary tale, even in grant cases, you need to uh, be sure to uh, discuss the measure of damages. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, although the case law is, is, uh, is uh, fairly consistent, at least from our government's perspective, uh, there, Pam, you have handled at one of the cases that we cited, one of the recent settlements. And so I think it probably makes sense to turn it over to you to talk about um, uh, your views on, on, on determining damages in grant cases and then also um, settlement of those, those grant cases because, um, you know, 
there's a lot more uh, flexibility in a settlement context, and so uh, it might be useful to, to, to hear from you. Sure, and I, thanks, Ed. And I do think, um, I think you make a really good distinction, which is when there's fraud in the inducement, meaning fraud in the original application, you should never have gotten the grant. Then, of course, in my view, the, the grant's going to be tainted, and it, it would be hard to find a way to claw back any of the money received. You know, the whole thing is going to go going to go down the tubes on that one. But I don't think that's the usual case. The usual case is they get the money and it's okay, and then they do something wrong. Something happens is they execute the grant and carry it out that when they're sending these, you know, periodic requests for the drawdown or periodic updates that this is what we're using the money for, that kind of thing, that's usually where things go off the rails. And so I think you can have these situations where you can find a way to say, the government got some value, it just didn't get as much value as it paid for. Um, and again, they are very fact specific. Uh, I would say in the one that we settled with regard to um, the city of Los Angeles is still litigating the case. It's a HUD fraud having to do with affordable housing. And the issue is the housing that was built in Los Angeles under the HUD money, which was a block grant to the city of Los Angeles, was that uh, appropriately um, did there were, were there a sufficient number of units that were available to disabled persons? And were the units that were available properly advertised and uh, put on people put on lists and things like that so the people who um, need assistance in where they live, that they can have a chance at those those housing units. And so we had a, a misspend of money in Los Angeles. It was uh, not great. So anyway, so we settled that case by looking at what was the value received and then working through basically the facts on a very minute level. Um, and I do think that's kind of the way to go on these. You have to get down into the weeds. The, the typical grant cases that I know we work on are actually these research cases coming out of the universities. The universities uh, and public institutions seem to spend the government's money uh, pretty regularly, and they often do commingling or they don't follow the rules of the grant or whatever happens, and the government doesn't get its money's worth. So I do expect, uh, especially with some changes that happened recently, with how the NIH reviews grants, that we're going to see a lot more of these research cases, as probably we should. I'm not sure everybody who's a scientist really follows the rules with regard to how to spend the money. Yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, following on to the point on on settlements and and um, additional flexibility. Uh, we don't have a slide on this, but the last uh, area that we were going to address uh, was the context of fairness hearings. Um, we, uh, in the context of a settlement, obviously the government has uh, some additional flexibility. Defendants have additional flexibility in the positions they can take. Um, we don't have to agree necessarily on uh, how the damages were calculated in order to reach a settlement. It used to be that we just needed to agree on the uh, settlement amount and the covered conduct. Now we have to agree on the restitution amount and the settlement amount and the covered conduct, but still um, it, we don't have to agree necessarily on how we got there. And um, so that allows us to reach resolutions. Um, it also, uh, raises issues that you think you're all done with a settlement and uh, um, ready to move forward and uh, it can still end up in court and that's in the context of a fairness hearing uh, where in the context of a key TAM the relator challenges the settlement as being not fair adequate and reasonable and uh, it's brought to the court for a hearing and uh, it's fairly rare that this occurs. Um, and so I was surprised when we were talking in advance of this panel that two of our panelists have actually participated in, uh, um, in fairness hearings. So I, I, I thought it would be interesting to get their viewpoints on, on those. Um, Eric, why don't we start with you and, and, and how, this, uh, how this went down in your, in your case? Sure, thanks, Ed. The, um, as you said, it, it's rare, obviously, um, when you settle a, a False Claims Act case, uh, you want peace, you want global peace, you want the relator happy, uh, you want the, well, you don't want them happy, but you, at least you want them accepting, um, and you want to get the case behind you. But there are situations in which um, 
sometimes, uh, and I think that uh, maybe more times than not, at the end, the government is an easier party to negotiate with than some relators um, because some relators uh, have a view of just trying to figure out how they can maximize their return. Well, the government's got an obligation to do justice uh, and doing justice uh, means coming up with a, a resolution that uh, is a fair application of the law to the facts as they see it. So it is not unusual to find yourself in a situation where you have negotiated or are on the cusp of negotiating a settlement with the government that the relator is not entirely happy with. Now, the government's got a lot of leverage to apply, and um, most of the time, uh, even if the relator is initially pushing back against the settlement, they'll accept it. Sometimes there are some additional concessions that need to be made to accomplish that, sometimes not. Um, but I did have a situation uh, years ago, and this was one of the first fairness hearings, I think, where um, we and the government were at a settlement in like the million and a half range. Um, but the relator thought it was a case that was worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and would not budge. Uh, we went before a magistrate to try to mediate it, and that didn't work. Um, and in the end, uh, after everything was tried to get uh, Relators Council on board, we had a fairness hearing. The judge, at the time, there wasn't a lot of case law on what the standard was to be applied. The judge ruled that it's the class action standard for assessing uh, the fairness of uh, of the settlement, you know, the basic uh, adequacy um, taking into account all the relevant factors. So the court held a hearing. It was not um, an evidentiary hearing in the sense of a hearing in which the rules of evidence apply, but it was one in which the court wanted to hear uh, from primarily from defense counsel and the relator, but also the government um, as to their respective views of the case, and then from the government as to why the government thought it was a fair and reasonable settlement. Now, it put the government in an awkward position because the government um, didn't want to go in and make sorts of, all sorts of arguments that basically favored the defense view because the government's you know, always worried about their words in one case will be used against them in another case. So it was very much a process where um, the defense had to take the mantle and, and take on the cause in the first instance. And the hearing was really a, a day-long oral argument with summaries of the law, summaries of the evidence, PowerPoints. Um, some important documents shown on the screen by both sides that took up the vast majority of the day. Um, at the end of the day, the government um, had a very brief discussion with the court uh, on the record with respect to its views of the settlement and why it thought that the position that was entered into was fair and reasonable without entirely or ever, or ever really completely adopting the defendant's views, but always uh, phrasing it in terms of, of litigation risk. Um, and the court, as I think, you know, the courts are, are want to do here, um, was ready to pay the government very, very substantial difference. And, and the so that was my experience. And let me turn it over to Pam for hers. So mine was more recent. It was just about a year ago. We did it in that case involving the housing in, in Los Angeles. We had a, a relator. There were two relators in the case. One signed off on the settlement and the other didn't. So we had to have a fairness hearing with regard to the one relator. The tricky part was we had one defendant settling and one defendant not settling. And so the government had this difficult situation where they didn't really want the unsettling defendant, which was the city of Los Angeles, to have access to all their thinking about why they settled the case. So we had to do things under seal. And um, I had a sense that this case might, uh, we might end up in a fairness hearing. It felt like one of those. You can sort of feel them coming. Um, the relator had a fight with her counsel and she ended up uh, firing her counsel. She was eventually pro se in the case, which is usually an indication that there's going to be trouble when it comes time to settle. So I had uh, given the government a series of, of letters laying out our settlement position in excruciating detail, the reason why we thought what we thought, understanding those were going to be shared with Relator, with the intention they'd be shared with Relator. And that was basically the record that we used at the time in front of the judge, so he could see the evolution of the communications and the, the methodology used. So it was understanding that I don't think he really wanted to have her speak in court uh, 
Um, the same way appellate judges don't like to have pro se people argue cases in front of them. So we ended up doing it under seal on the record in front of him with questions, but mostly uh, the paper record was what uh, was used to make that decision. I did find when we were looking for the case law that there wasn't a lot of case law and we didn't have settled law in the Ninth Circuit as to how the judge was supposed to do this. So we just briefed the different ways the judge can do it. And he just, like any judge, right, he just found it under both standards, um, the class action, and there was another standard that he used. So it was uh, it was something just if you think it's coming, um, think about how to make your record is the only advice I can give on that. But they are rare as hen's teeth. I've been doing this area of law for 30 years, and it's the only one I've ever seen. So they're not, they, you can feel them coming, but you're likely not going to hit one in a, in a long career. Thank you, Pam. I think that that um, comes to uh, takes us to the end of of uh, the substantive portion of our, our conversation here today. And we would um, I'd love to to take this opportunity with the few minutes we have left to answer any questions that you may have. Um, there is a chat feature, uh, hopefully on the screen, um, and you can type in your questions, um, and we would be happy to answer them. Um, so we'll give you a, a couple of minutes to do that. Um, in the meantime, while while we're waiting for any questions to come in, Sarah, let me let me ask you a, a question that I had from from my presentation. I invite the other panelists if they have any further questions for the panelists while we wait to do this as well. But um, in in settling uh, any kickback act cases, um, do you do you ever look to any alternative measures such as the value of the kickback or the value of the services the government received in looking at what's a fair settlement or a, a, do the states take the position that um, a forfeiture is a forfeiture? Right, and I, I suppose I should say the same thing that Ed did at the beginning of the that I only speak for myself and the, my opinions are not necessarily those of my office. Um, but I always start um, with the point of view that of Rogan and that it's the full value of the claim. And typically when we have a kickback case, it's a very strong one. And that's that's where I kind of draw my line. But it, um, obviously it's a case by case basis though. Hey, Eric, let me, let me ask, uh, let me ask Ed a question on that. I, I'm always wondering as the guidance has changed and I recognize we're in the middle of a transition so we don't know what the guidance is going to be next year. But um, is there any special uh, approvals that you guys have to get to be able to settle for less than full value? Or is it just part of the mix and it's just like any other settlement? There's no difference. Yeah. So uh, the level of authority that's required for a particular settlement is governed by uh, regulation. And so... Um, there's um, if the settlement is less than a certain dollar threshold in terms of damages, it can be uh, approved by either the U.S. attorney or by uh, the director of our office, the fraud section. Um, and then if it's over that dollar threshold, which I believe is $10 million, then the assistant attorney general uh, needs to authorize the settlement. There's also a provision that if the settlement is a particular percentage lower than the actual damages, if we're compromising a claim, um, then we need to get higher authority for compromising a claim. Um, but in, in most cases, um, we are when we're doing a settlement, we're resolving the claim either for a multiple of damages, so the restitution is the damages that's identified in the settlement agreement, and then the settlement is some multiple of that, or it's an ability to pay settlement context and we're compromising it based on the defendant's ability to pay. So it, it um, so the answer is yes. If, if we were compromising a, a, a case and discounting the damages significantly, uh, then we would be uh, required to go to a higher level. Uh, I believe the associate needs to uh, to approve it if it if we're compromising the claim uh, above more than fifteen percent below the actual damages. Um, but in most cases where we're we're seeking authority for settlement, we're obtaining uh, multiples of the damages, um, and and we may be defining the damages uh, more narrowly and giving a more narrow release to cover those damages. Um, 
but but that's there, there's no special authority for using a different damages model. Thanks, Ed. So, Ed, Ed, let me put this question to you that's come in. Um, in grant cases, does the government have problems with going after public institutions? Insofar as there are or used to be case law that those institutions are not, quote, persons, end quote, under the yeah. False Claims Act. Yeah, there's been some case law under uh, the, the False Claims Act in terms of, uh, of persons and whether a, uh, an institution is an arm of the state. Um, and we've briefed those, briefed those issues and, and the arm of the state analysis is generally a fairly fact specific analysis. Um, and then there's separate analysis of whether the United States, uh, could, could pursue those claims, even if it's determined that, uh, uh, defendant is an arm of the state. So I guess it makes it more complicated. Um, but, and, and there's potentially litigation going on there or, you know, in, in if we litigation of those issues, if we pursue those claims, but, uh, but it's a, it's a fact specific analysis, whether they're an arm of the state. And we would take the position that, um, I guess we, I would take the position that <laughs> we would <laughs> be able to pursue those claims. Um, and I see there's another, um, a uh, question from Derek Adams, uh, formerly from our office, uh, asking about uh, quasi-grant or and loan programs like the Paycheck Protection uh, Program, and and that's an issue that I think is going to be addressed in in great detail um, in the grant uh, grant case. They're going to be talking about COVID uh, type loan programs and what the theories are with respect to those. So I, I would defer to that. Um, that issue. So we have an additional question, um, which is how are relators fees determined? Uh, what are the main factors? Uh, anyone want to feel that? Let me, let me take a first stab at it and then invite everybody else to, for their input. Um, I think the case law is pretty, it's pretty developed out there in terms of the standards that, uh, that courts will use in assessing relators fees. Um, they use a lodestar. Uh, take a look at what was um, reasonable under the circumstances. What the what the fees are that are um, are generally paid in that particular jurisdiction for a case of that complexity. Uh, they will also look at what the um, you know what the what the rates are with respect to um, the other potentially the other lawyers involved in the case for the defense side. Um, they'll take a look at the amount of work that was required. Um, they're the pitfalls that one faces uh, in, in billing any case, really, which is uh, courts will be mindful of duplication. Uh, they'll be mindful of excessive work. I've seen a number of cases where courts have criticized uh, block billing by Relators Council and have rejected fee petitions to the extent that they were based on block billing. So I think it's really uh, very much a reasonable standard based on a pretty well-developed lodestar analysis in the case law. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? It's one area that we don't get involved in. <laughs> yeah, we hear that a lot from the government. Thanks, Ed. We really appreciate the support. <laughs> well, I think we're coming to the, the end of our time. So um, I, I just wanted to, to thank the panel again um, for the terrific work in, in putting this together in the presentation today and thank the audience uh, for their questions. Um, and also thank, uh, as I'm told, I should do the ABA and the ABA criminal justice section for uh, for helping this, um, uh, putting this together. The 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 next uh, presentation, which will occur at 3:30, um, is uh, going to be a very interesting one. The view ahead. Um, so I certainly encourage everyone to rejoin 15 minutes from now um, to take uh, to take advantage of that program. So again. Thanks everyone for their time today um, and we appreciate the opportunity to present today.